you know, we, food was food. Then we learned about nutrition and food became protein, carbs and fats and macronutrients. And then the more we learned, the more food just became food again. Right. Because as we talked about in the beginning of this, right, it's, it's all sort of the same trends coming and going. And then the only thing you can really do is eat in a way that makes you feel good or don't eat food to make you feel badly. Bringing you a reasoned approach to health and fitness. This is the Fi Life Podcast. Welcome to the Fi Life Podcast. I'm John Barbin. With me is Brad Pilon. And today we're going to talk about what has and hasn't changed with uh, diet and nutrition advice over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to go that far back for too much of it. Um, but, you know, some things have changed, something hasn't. And I guess, Brad, you've already generated a bit of a list of what we're going to cover. So I'll throw it to you to kind of set out the template here. And the other thing is what what this means for you. Like maybe yeah. no one really cares what was going on 25 years ago. Uh, but I think it'll be informative to know how many things haven't changed is probably what's going to be really informative. And this will also be important um, for you to know for for you to know that to see what's how it applies to your life. So I'll throw it over to you. Dude, the, the, the obvious answer is not, nothing has changed. The, the words we use to describe everything has, has changed, but the actual practices haven't changed. So you've, you've got three macronutrients, right? We have our protein, our carbs, and our fats. And we just cycle between which one should be low, which one should be high, and why. But then even past that, do you remember, so back in the day when we were working with um, female fitness competitors, Remember, they wouldn't eat past 6 p.m. because they thought the calories they ate past 6 would be stored as fat when they were sleeping because they weren't moving. And they all believed that. And whether or not that was right or wrong, the issue is they were intermittent fasting, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're, and then fasted cardio became popular. And we're talking late 90s here. So they extended the fast in the morning so they could go to the gym and get a workout in. So that's a 14 hour fast. They didn't call it intermittent fasting and they weren't doing it for any of our traditional reasons, right? That it was just to them at the time, the science suggested, not really, but that the, the food they ate at night would somehow be stored as fat because they were sleeping and not moving around, right? So that's just a great example of how our reasonings are changing. You know, our, our big fancy words are changing but the actual practices are, are pretty much the same. I mean, you and I were in the supplement industry when leptin just started coming. I mean, I think the original leptin papers were 94, 96, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. So leptin was just becoming a thing and it was a reason then to eat carbs again. But it just meant a cycle back to a higher carb diet for the people who were on the fringes, right? So... I think our fringes have gotten bigger, right? Like we've moved all the way to in 2023, you got people doing carnivore, like just red meat diets, which is the absolute fringe of a high protein diet, which is a fringe of like an Atkins. And then you have vegan is, is fairly new. I don't think we knew any vegans in the late nineties, but it's just a more extreme vegetarian, right? More extreme, whether it's um, health conscious or animal rights, whatever it is, they've sort of taken it out but in general, we look at the same thing because there isn't that much to play with. I mean, the we talk about a lower intake of processed foods, but that's just a rebranding of don't eat as much junk food or fast food, right? Mm -hmm. We just change the words. Um, a high protein diet has been a thing since the 80s, I, I think. And then if you just cycle back, we'll probably find evidence. I think in Bernard McFadden's book, we found high protein diets and that was late 1800s, early 19s, yeah, something like yeah. that. So we're just cycling through. And I think that's an important thing for everyone to remember is there's only so much you can do with these diets. Now we're finding new reasons and, and new science and deeper science. So um, my great example is my very basic understanding of cholesterol is like HDL, good, LDL, bad. Your understanding of cholesterol is just levels above that. But the sort of the approaches ends up being very similar. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah. and you, you said something there that made me think it's more about the information back then when it was just magazines, there's not a lot of access. There was no internet. 
you ended up the people who, like you say, who stopped eating after a, a certain time because they thought it was just going to get stored. Um, it, if there was no scientific basis for that, people ended up reading about and being exposed to just the people who bothered to try something. Yes. So obviously at the time, uh, when they're doing this, uh, there's, there's a lot of people academically who understood, well, that doesn't make any sense, but they're not in, in the magazines. They're not on no. TV. They're not anyone you are hearing from. So the casual person just trying to figure out what maybe they should do. Again, all of this usually started with bodybuilding and getting in shape. That idea. Always from the fringe in. Right, right. Yeah. But what I'm saying is when this all started, people weren't necessarily training for athletics or anything. They were or eating for that. It was all eating yeah. was always about getting in shape, usually losing fat and gaining some muscle. Um, so but the only the only people you had to look to were the people already doing it which were fitness yeah. competitors, maybe not even, was there even fitness back there? It was bodybuilding, really. Um, it was bodybuilding and female fitness was just coming in with oxygen. Right. But, but, but preceding that, like in the seventies, let's say when it got famous was with Schwarzenegger yeah. and those guys. I don't, I don't think women were even doing it then. So the only reference point anyone had even preceding when, you know, our, when we were alive or right around when we were born was those guys. And that was the foundation for all of this, like the eating six yeah. small meals a day, you're keeping your metabolism going, all of the diet. And we used to always say this, all of the diet habits in the industry still, they still persist to this day, are all rooted in old school classic bodybuilders who were the only people, let's say visibly, changing their bodies, like yeah. where you could yeah. see it. You could see Mr. Olympia or Mr. Universe or whoever it was, and Schwarzenegger, Frigno, those guys. Uh, Schwarzenegger is probably the one that, like, for instance, my Everyone mom, knows. my mom could name, but yeah. you'd have to be really into it to know, like, Serge Nubre or some of those old guys. Um, right. But those are the first people with any sort of, I would say, mainstream media exposure who had, whichever mainstream was back then, like, barely even on TV. Like, I don't know if you yeah. could watch the Mr. He Olympia. did, like, Schwarzenegger did late night talk shows, like, uh, who was before yeah. Letterman Carson? Like maybe even before yeah. that, it was so he was the one to kind of break those boundaries. But then he brought with him the how did you get so big? And the, the real answer you can't say on a late night talk show. So it's just, you know, right. eating and training. Yeah. Right, right. And then years and years, decades later, like, well, we use a little bit of steroids, but not that much. Yeah. And, and the <laughs> new bit. guys use way more than us. But come on. Yeah. Like these, I mean, anyone in the know, and we'll talk about this at length on other shows, but yeah, anyone in the know can when you're in the uncanny valley like you're just way bigger than anything you've ever seen there's a reason but anyways back to the nutrition thing these are the first people who were effectively uh let's just set aside gaining muscle these were the people who were effectively stripping body fat off to um impressive impressive levels and anyone who's thinking about diet let's be honest health is the secondary effect it's always can i lose fat can i look better and just yeah. assuming assuming that uh, health benefits are a secondary to looking I, I don't know the look you're almost you think you want and you think will look better you'll feel more confident you'll l like the way you look in the mirror you're just assuming that's also a healthier look you're just not assuming yeah. the the more aesthetically pleasing i look even to myself who cares what anyone else thinks if i just like the way i look in the mirror mo no one thinks that must be uh, that must be a less healthy look for me like i just can't think anyone thinks that so these are the first guys that were doing it like with with real effectiveness that anyone could see. Like even yeah. if you don't buy the magazine, you can pass by it in the in the grocery store. A uh, man or woman can see like God, that guy is that that's pretty lean. Like most people don't look like that. And, and the next thing you ask yourself is, I wonder what they're doing. Right. So you pick up the magazine. Well, yeah. Yeah. And you flip through it and you realize, oh, they eat a lot of protein. They eat really frequently. That must be what I'm supposed to do. Whether right. or not they had a clue scientifically of any of it was valid, it was working and they were doing it. So, and that's the part that matters, right? Yes. It and, was uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All of this still to this day, a lot of what people think is the right thing to do is all downstream of just the people who are trying it. Not there's no, yeah. not that now there's double blind placebo controlled scientific studies proving one diet works better than the other. Sure. There's research done on many diets. But it, it, people didn't wait around for that stuff. Like no. these guys were just doing it and other people were like, works for him. I'm going to do it. 
And it still to this day, a lot of people like don't really care what a research paper says. They're like, I don't know, man, whatever. It just works. So do you know how you get people to care about research mm -hmm. is we forget this whole eight page research study. And I don't know if you have to black out the faces or whatever it is, but you show pictures of the subjects because people can read about it. But the thing that will get someone to try a diet is someone else's body and go, oh, my God, that person looks great. What did they do? Not, oh my gosh, look at that person's numbers on a piece of paper. What do they do? Right? It's the people would, you could have a study with 300 people and all 300 got in great shape, but just I write, they got in great shape. Or Chris Hemsworth could show up for the next Thor movie and you'd be like, hey, I'm doing what he's doing. That's insane. Right? Like it's, does he have a diet written somewhere? Like that sort of thing. It's, it's the image of it tells you its effectiveness. And that's not correct, but it's how we view it always have as humans. Right? So if very, very, you know, physically ideal people are following a certain diet, you're going to tend to gravitate towards that diet. In fact, Twitter is a great example of it, right? You'll have fully, you know, renowned researchers, PhDs talking on Twitter about a certain diet and what works and what doesn't. And one of the comments underneath would be like, yeah, but where are your abs? Right? Like, okay. Okay. So, but on that point, I think, I, whether or not the words irony, um, this is the one field that academically from a research standpoint, you can, you can know based on the data, based on even coaching people, you can know what has worked for many people, but yeah. you're right. If you haven't done it yourself, people are not going to, people are being like, well, I don't, you no, you don't know. It's like, well, but I've trained yeah, a bunch of people. doesn't matter. I've done multiple research papers. I have very good clinical evidence, you know, statistically significant, like, you know, randomized, like all the stuff. So bias is out the window. I can tell you definitively what worked for all of these people. Like, but, but, but if you're not in shape, people are like, yeah, you don't know. It's not like you would challenge an engineer about that or challenge uh, <laughs> people in any other field. It's like, oh, really? Have yeah. you built a plane? Then you don't know if wings work. And if have you built a bridge, then how do you know? Like, it's not going to fall down because you haven't built one yet. It's well, well, the, the, the data is the data. The science is clear. But in this particular field, if you haven't walked the walk, people don't want to listen to you. Do you remember when Dr. Atkins died and the rumor floating around pre, pre internet was that he was, when he died, he was like 50 mm -hmm. pounds overweight. And that was like, like a nail in the, oh, nail in the coffin's a bad word talking about death. That was really bad. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Uh, bad for the sales of the, the new Atkins diet revolution because it, it got around that, that he was actually overweight and somehow that hurt, even though the book had sold millions upon millions of copies, you know, and you had, you know, what, hundreds of thousands of people saying this worked for me. It just took the rumor that the original author was overweight for it to be. Kind I of thought he was like, I thought he was like 250 pounds. I thought it was huge. maybe. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, and then it was like, no, it was something to do with when he died or I, I forget mm. what it was, but it, it, it hurts that diet. doesn't matter how yeah. many people found it to be effective. Um, and Bill Phillips understood this with muscle media 2000 turned into muscle media, which is a, a old school magazine. Mm -hmm. He just used himself always as an N of one on every diet and had a good enough physique for the time. He wasn't quite bodybuilder big, but he was noticeably, I work out that kind of, well, we would consider the celebrity body nowadays. He kind of mm -hmm. had that going yeah. on yeah. and it was enough for everyone. They're like, yeah, but it worked for him. Look, right. And that's, that's what determined that we all followed a higher protein, eight meal a day eating routine was because of him. 258 is what we're being told is what Atkins yeah, that, that he died. That's, that's yeah, I, I rem yeah, I remember being quite big and, and I mean, you know, God rest his soul. He, he's not around to hear people rip on whether or not the diet is effective, but that, hmm. Like a reverse yeah. N of one, right? Like yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this gets to... Uh, again, we're, we're, we're just, we're trying to re reiterate the importance of how, uh, diet, diet and nutrition information, um, the importance of knowing where the source is coming from and whether or not you should yep. do anything with that information uh, and your biases and your biases. So yep. just because, you know, Atkins met some, he was a higher body weight when he died. We don't actually know 
It's not, he might have had some other physical uh, ailments or conditions that, that were never disclosed that led to that, that had nothing to do with whether or not it was a reasonable way to eat, which I think it was. It was fine. You know, yeah. it's fine. For, for it's people. a reasonable way to eat. Made sense. Um, again, it doesn't it doesn't address the idea of total volume. Like if you're just eating too much, you can do it in balance ratios. You can do it with too much of anything. Too much is still yep. too much. But it did, also doesn't take into account people's specific metabolic issues. Like you, he could have developed some condition that that we don't know about that it didn't matter how his macros were. It was he was leading to this one way or another, uh, yeah. not to just completely pick on him, but as a good example of do you walk the walk? And if he did walk his own walk and he ended up th at this size anyways, does that discredit his whole theory? Uh, no, but, yeah. but people will see it that way. People will see it that way. And that's what you and I actually have term for that. And that was image illusion, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the idea of what's being presented in front of you is a direct result of that diet, right? So a great example, vegans are all skinny and carnivores are all jacked, right? And you just, Unfortunately, you kind of jump on Twitter or Instagram and some of the larger proponents of veganism, like Dr. Greger, are, are, are not overly muscular people. And some of the proponents of carnivore are, and that just kind of seeps in. Whereas if the our, our secret vegan society had funded Ryan Reynolds, Ryan Gosling, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, and all big guys, like, we're going to pay you millions, but you're going to say you're vegan for these movies maybe people would think vegans were all big, right? Like, so that image illusion, that, that image you get in your head right away is a large part of why you follow a certain diet. And, and you gotta be careful of that because it, it's oftentimes just sort of a bias that's fallen into you the way you think. Yeah, and I don't think the biases are fully unfounded. There's probably like a tiny little kernel of truth they're, they're chasing. Like they're like, well, vegans couldn't possibly get enough protein in. And I know protein must have something to do with muscle. So, right. you know, I'm going to put those two things together and ipso facto vegans can't have muscle. And then, yeah. you know, carnivores, well, protein, protein, that's, isn't that, don't you need a lot of protein for muscle building? So if I eat like red meat, isn't meat itself like muscle? Like if so, if you eat a bunch a reduction of reduction of serdum or we just take it down to its, yeah, ipso adam, ipso adam serdum. So it, I'm not even going to try to say that. I will butcher it. <laughs> sorry. Reductio ad absurdum. Uh, we're making yeah. this up anyways. No, that's, that's the, straight from Hogwarts, right? Like, <laughs> right. So, but the thing is, if you uh, combine with the image illusion, so just pair up anyone yeah. who looks like how you want them to look. Yeah. And you just say, oh, a carnivore is going to be muscular. And you, somebody, somebody who happens to be muscular, you just takes one person to make a picture, like in, linking yeah. the two and people, oh yeah, it makes total sense eating a lot of meat. So there's like a, a nugget of kernel of truth to the, I can see how you logically get from veganism is hard to get a lot of protein. I know protein has something to do with muscle. Therefore, it, it makes sense. Most vegans must be just under muscled. And yeah. from what I understand, a lot of bodybuilders eat a lot of red meat and red meat is protein. And that's the direct line to building muscle. The thing is, in either case, a vegan or a carnivore per, carnivore diet person, if they're, they're not lifting weights, it's not building muscle either way. Like it yeah. doesn't matter what you're eating if you're not like it's the weight training that stimulates the muscle growth. The source of protein is sort of irrelevant. Yeah, I'm going to take image illusion even farther because it'll take our, our conversation a different direction. Is you know whether you're doing the Mediterranean diet, uh, intermittent fasting, carnivore, vegan, vegan, um, the thing they all have in common is they're they're suggesting this is the way you were designed to eat, which is an interesting concept because for some reason our view of paleolithic man sort of early um fred flintstone caveman type of thing is mm. this again a cross between like chris hemsworth and a silverback gorilla right we just we just picture these massive muscular hominids and be like well that's that diet made them look that way right and they were obviously athletic and they were obviously you know just so mobile and so that must be how we should eat and i've always found that fascinating so i'm like well those are drawings Right. Like it's, mm. it's, it's, it's a weird concept when, especially when you look back at it and you're like, well, okay, they were five, four to five, seven. And based on, it's kind of like a, a forensic science, but based on the bone cell mass we kind of estimated they have, we could estimate their fat free mass. And it's, it's not that big. They weren't, they weren't these monstrosities wandering around the earth. Now, Neanderthals were a bit bigger, but they weren't sort of our romanticized version of, of what they are, yet we love that idea of returning to a natural way to eat or the way we were designed to eat. 
Yeah. And that's a good point that it's an estimation. And no matter, again, these are all, it's modeling. So all we got are bones. We've no one, no one ever has laid eyes on a Neanderthal in person moving around and has a, can just be, oh, they were pretty big dudes. Like, so I'm pretty no close in our university gym, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, where all of this theory comes from, like eat, eat paleo. I mean, it, with the paleo stuff, didn't they actually find, um, in some of the, in some of the bones and the teeth, they actually found grains, grains of and wheat and different and... things. So kind of disproving that they just ate like a carnivore type diet. They did. What it was available to keep you alive. Yeah. Yeah. Just eat anything. Yeah. How could they not be omnivores? They were. You want some honey? No, dude, I'm, I'm paleo. Yeah. We're going to die if we don't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you yeah. kidding me? I'm working on my abs. So, <laughs> so, but no one laid eyes on them then. We're just modeling yeah. to assume what they look like. And I, that maybe gave me a thought. We would have a very limited ability, if at all, to remove our bias of what people look like now and graph that onto our modeling assumption of what they must have looked like then yes like yeah. whatever whatever you think you've whatever you've seen as lean or muscular or endomorph ectomorph mesomorph whatever whatever you would imagine that the model is predicting they might have looked like your imagination can only go as far as what you've ever seen people kind of look like so yeah. drawings and then you're then you're relying on drawings and comic books and you know that kind of thing. yeah i mean and i guess if you've seen super people with like massive muscles that that were on super physiological doses of drugs uh, i don't know if that also influences influences your thoughts thinking well how muscular could these guys actually be but like that's yeah but no one's that muscular now without drugs so how on earth could they have been then so if if your thought was they were any of them could have been heavily muscled based you know based on the modeling from bones so it, who cares who cares what anyone looked like back then? And all yeah. you, what you can do is you can try any of these diets. You can adopt any of them and see how it goes for you. It doesn't matter. Even the theory where it comes from really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it does in anybody else. All that matters is what it does to your specific physiology. Exactly. Because we're all slightly different. So here's a great practice for the whole eating how we were designed, right? So we can generally agree we shared a ancestor with chimpanzees like five, seven million years ago, right? So we have a ancestral link to a diet like early primates. These primates were sort of tropical, right? And they were largely frugivore. So they ate a lot of fruit, like 80% of their diet. So, okay, let's go by design. Let's just start. We have tricolor vision, great for foraging right? Um, we're really good at picking out way better than carnivores at pinks, at purples, at bright reds. Our noses, you and I can't smell a predator coming, but we know when a fruit is ripe. Okay. Our teeth are, these aren't really carnivores. I mean, I, canines, we can pretend they are, but neither of us have fangs. You and I can taste sweet. My cat uh, can, I can't. can I pause you there? I think it would be yeah. super cool to have fangs, but anyways. Oh, it would be, yeah, be, yeah. yeah. Definite party trick, right? Yeah. But so like cats, true obligate carnivores, they don't taste sweet and we, we love it, right? So as much as we know sugar is bad for you, we, we admit we, we love it. Then when it gets down to our GI system, we have a GI system very similar to like orangutans and, and chimpanzees. Our transit time is not that of a carnivore, which is like two and a half hours to 24 hours. Um, Try, trying to think of what else. It just goes, oh, what we have a saculated colon, whereas um, true carnivores don't. So from a pure design point of view, you could argue frugivore. Now, the pH of our stomach is really, really low, lower than a carnivore, but in line with a scavenger, like a turkey vulture type of thing, right? So we probably did get a, a fair amount of meat from the guy let the lions do the killing and I went and took the extra little bit that's left over. So you just go, whoa, it, it's almost undeniable that our design would be one of us frugivore scavenger. The problem with that is that, you know, that was millions of years ago and fruit is different now. So mm -hmm. fruit had actually a higher protein content way back. It didn't taste nearly the same. Um, it didn't, wasn't as big and plump as juicy. So the caloric density was higher. So even though you have this perfect design, you can make a great argument. Um, you have to be careful when you do that because you also don't live in that time, right? So you you really would have a hard time living a pure frugivore diet 
without some sort of supplementation of, of a bit more meat than usual, et cetera, because you have to go with the times for a lack of a better term, but the fruit, the food's not the same. Um, similar with a carnivore, like I don't know my exact, you know, tropical, subtropical African um, animal wildlife, but I'm pretty sure Wagyu cows were not part of that. Yeah. Right. And in fact, if you think about it, yeah, was wild? somebody was someone massaging the cows for like exactly. a better mar- better marbling? Oh, it, marbling is exactly the point I was going to get at. These are wild animals. They were probably incredibly lean because the argument is right. That's it's our sedentary lifestyles that makes us and our pets fatter. Um, so these would be lean, lean animals. You wouldn't have that body fat, and they certainly wouldn't be cows, less at least highly marbled cows. So our arguments of how we should eat based on the past are riddled with errors in the fact that because we don't live in the past so that would be true if we lived back then yeah and on top of that the assumptions we haven't evolved like nothing's like we haven't evolved in all of those years nothing we haven't like nothing's changed now i get it there's a mismatch there's there's true mismatch going on where we're not evolved for how fast our current society let's say uh, our current food supply is changing way faster than we can keep up with but we have certainly evolved from uh, back then till now where these theories of like, oh, we, if we ate like that hundreds of thousands of years ago, we must, we haven't changed yeah. at all. And then you have the whole epigenetic component, which is quick evolved, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it, it just goes and goes and goes. We're but different. On, on, a, on a broader scale, we have evolved from that. We're capable of evolving and and we have. And I can see people getting tripped up because society is moving so, um, our food supply and our modern food supply is moving so quickly. It feels like we're way out of whack. So, yeah. but they're, it's an overcorrection. It's like, oh, okay. Food has gotten um, way more palatable. Like we've just, it's true that if you, you don't have to go too far back that we just never had something as sweet or as palatable as like a Snickers bar. Like it, that's yeah. an engineered food and it's designed the sugar, the salt, the fat, the sweet, the chewiness, how quickly you can, um, chew it up all of it is is designed to be like wow i can i just want more of that forget what it's called the way it balls in the mouth even right like it's yeah yeah. well it's designed to mash up in like three bites into like a nice um, brilliant kind of like within three bites it mashes like uniformly even though there's like chocolate and peanuts and whatever the other stuff is in there whereas if you tried to build one yourself it would all crumble it'd be a mess it wouldn't it wouldn't be as palatable so um it's quite an engineering feat to make one of those break down as smoothly as they break down bite after bite and literally within a few bites um so so yeah we are our nature and the way we experience it is not quite ready to be able to control most of us to control ourselves when we're around things that palatable and that well designed so from that standpoint our ability to manipulate the food supply is moving way quicker than we can evolve to keep up with it but that but that doesn't mean well then that must mean we're still built like we were five hundred thousand years ago like it's that's right yeah so it's a it's a it's losing sight of the yes it's yeah we're, we're trying to keep up we're just the food supply is just changing so quickly um but in the end the other thing i or another thing i would say about thinking how how did we eat ancestrally are we're living even with this mismatch of the new food supply and like processed foods and all the all the evils you want to say about modern food we're living longer than we ever have with this mess that we're in let's call it with our difficulty handling all these different diets and modern food so if the argument what's the end goal what's the argument like oh we're living we're not living as long yeah we are now that that could think about that you could feed someone McDonald's from birth until death. They they would probably make it 60, maybe 70 years of life just doing that. And then, you know, you could feed them super healthy and they might get like 70, 80. Like it's pretty fun. It's we are robust creatures. If you actually yeah. think about some of the garbage people eat and, and how long we can manage to live, which is an amazing testament to our health care and just the um, how sturdy we're built. Yeah, well, the, speaking of evolution, one of the things that has evolved is modern medicine. Yeah. So evolution, very quickly, it, in a more abstract thought, evolution doesn't have to just be at the genetic cellular level of your body. It could be the evolution of the society, and it and the thing we've grown or evolved into is a modern medical system based on scientific inquiry to deal with the things that come up. 
So you're using evolution, not just as the um, person, but the, but our environment as well. And yeah. how much, so the, even though we're not evolving quickly, we are causing our environment via AI robotics and intelligence to evolve at a fast rate as well. So that's a cool way to think of it. The, yeah, yeah. the, the creature and its environment. Right. Yeah. And if we didn't e quote unquote evolve a medical system, we'd be in, we'd oh, be in trouble. Term. Like yeah. just, just think, just think of like, I just recently had a, a surgery and we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but I, I really appreciate, we figured out general anesthetic. I yeah. way not want to, <laughs> yeah. well, I've the, I mean, if you just read about how they did it before, I don't know, I guess you alcohol strap them down and just go. And, and just go. Ugh. Well, and they and they understood enough that we can cut X, Y, or Z out and they'll survive. But it's gonna hurt like hell while it's happening. Yeah. So I'm so happy the day they figured out they don't need to feel that. So um there's just a line between pre and post anesthesia, which to me is a major turning point in like all of human evolution, is just that delineation. Before this you felt it after this, we could do it without you feeling it. And then I'm sure I haven't dug right into it, but the practice of surgery and how many more things you could do would have had to have expanded wildly from there. Oh yeah. Just a, a complete like logarithmic increase. Right. So, yeah. So I get just an analogy of things changing over time along with yeah. diet changing over time. Yeah. And that's a great example. So for me, I mean, if people asked me, how they should eat. I do like that whole idea of a frugivore scavenger approach, lots of fruit and then the occasional bit of, of meat, etc. But in terms of actually advising people because of the world we live in, I think we waste a lot of time telling people how they ought to eat instead of looking at how they actually eat. And your Snickers bar is a great example because people by and large, especially in North America, eat a fair amount of processed food. And I think we're better off instead of telling them, knock that off is making the processed food healthier. You know what I mean? Like it's, so you have to kind of go with what they're doing, what's in their environment, because for a lot of people escaping that, especially with the costs involved in food in, in North America, the cost of a pint of blueberries versus, you know, McDonald's, you know, you, you almost have to lean towards that processed food. So slowly through human innovation, which again, it, you're arguing is a part of evolution, which is awesome. If we can start making our processed foods healthier, that would probably have a larger effect on a population than simply yelling at them that they should not eat as much processed food. Yeah. And that's happening. Like, for example, once we, now it's a little, I think people would hope it happens faster than it's happening, but we can only go at the speed of science and, and when demand, like, you know, when people really demand it, but uh, trans fats is a good example. Before yeah. we really had solid research on how, D harmful trans fats are metabolically uh they seemed like a good idea because they were vegetable based you know going back yep. to your point of like this this sort of battle between is animal fats and the saturated fats in animal products uh worse for you than anything that comes from vegetable and then mm -hmm. trans fats um i don't think we have to get to the biochemistry of it but a trans fat turned out to be way way worse even though they typically were from a, a plant-based source. So uh, just on a really high level, if you didn't have any training, you're like, oh, something from a plant, that sounds like it's got to be better than, you know, I thought red meat was bad, butter. you know, the fats yeah. in red meat, you have butter, whatever. So, but it turns out the trans fats were way, way more harmful. So head to head, if yeah. you chose, you would always chose, you would always choose the saturated fats or the fats in animal products over any trans fat, even if it was a plant source. And to your point, that worked its way out of processed foods. It was in for a while because they were really useful. They worked, they worked for um, stability, preservation. They were just handy to make food with, oh, like yeah. very, very mm -hmm. easy to make shelf stable foods with trans fats. Uh, they had all kinds of properties about like mouthfeel, taste, stability, all kinds of stuff. And then we're like, oh God, these are the worst possible things we could have made. So, yeah. so they're out now. So they processed their way in. And then they ended up processing their way out. So to your point, that's a quote unquote processed food that went full circle in and yeah. back out. So, yeah. it, so that's, it's happening. It just might be happening slower than anyone, um, would have, would have hoped. And that's because the data had to come out showing how bad they actually were. Well, you know, it's an interesting processing, f processed food, 
processed food. Anyway, an interesting um, evolution of our food that you could argue is both good and bad. I would argue there's a larger consumption of fruit now that we have seedless watermelons, seedless grapes as examples. Whereas before, the seed was a pain, and so you would avoid those fruits, right? So we've, you know, increased the palatability of, of some fruits, which then makes them easier to eat. Same with how we've slowly made apples sweeter and crispier. You know, it, it's selective breeding and it's, you know, slightly processing your fruits and vegetables, but it means people eat more of them, right? And if that's the goal is as a healthier population, then that's a good way to process our foods. As opposed to telling people, no, I know you hate it and it's gross because you got to spit the watermelon seeds out, but you got to eat more of this. They just, people won't do that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it comes down to um, making good for you foods more palatable and making processed, highly palatable foods more good for you would be the, the approach. But this is sort of population based. So on an individual level, you know, it's what has changed gets all the way back to what you're talking about. It's kind of like finding out what works for you and understanding that as hard as it is to wrap your head around sometimes what worked for them might not work for you and so you really do have to experiment find what's working for you and then if it is working with you don't let someone this is really hard to explain don't let someone talk you out of realizing it works for you so don't have really good results have someone say oh i, I heard that doesn't work and you think shit i guess it, guess it didn't work and we see that happen a lot Right. In, in I was just going to say, how crazy does that sound that you could convince somebody that what just happened wasn't and it was your goal and it worked and you can yeah. convince somebody out of it and they'll change. Yeah, we've seen that happen over and over again. Oh, yeah. And that's just the power of suggestion and being influenced by other people. So, yeah, a major takeaway message here is it absolutely does not matter what works for anybody else. It just matters what works for you. Guidelines and ideas, for things to try. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. this is epidemiological stuff. It's population based. It's averages like the mythical average 170 pound male and hundred and whatever, 50 pound female that, that neither of them exist. They're an average that that's not there's not that's not a person. That's a statistical yeah. avatar of a person that doesn't exist just for researchers to uh, come to a, a concept like a population based concept. But it right. doesn't mean any epidemiological research. I don't know if people realize this. It's never, ever meant to diagnose, treat, or prescribe one person anything. It just no, it's, doesn't it's, it's matter. Research on populations for populations, right? Yeah. Yes. It, it's for things like policy. It's for like, should we fortify water with fluoride? And I don't know. Maybe. Yes. No. Should we iodize salt? Like, it, like it's stuff like that. It's not... Mm -hmm. It's for general trends. It's never about, about one single person. It, it can't right. be. So I can say the population of the U.S. needs to lower their salt intake, but an in individual level, John Barber needs to increase his salt intake. Yes. And it's, both would be completely valid statements if the research supported it, right? But well, you because can't if you, And if you don't consider your exact numbers, how do you know where you are on the curve of data that adds up with the average number? Are you the guy bringing the number up or down? Right. This is another great point is even on research in small groups. So uh, 30 guys do a trial and the average weight loss is seven pounds. People sometimes don't realize that in that trial of those 30 guys, none of them could have lost seven pounds. It could have yes. been a couple who lost 13, 14 and a bunch lost four and not a single person actually lost that number seven. How? But we'll all say they all lost seven pounds, right? How how many pieces of data have we looked at where the average number there no one ever is on the average? Yeah, like it's it's no. a, and it's 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 the distribution thing is bimodal. So you have a bunch of people way higher and a bunch of people way lower. So you got yeah. people who zero zero right, like nothing happened, and people who have wild results. You're like, oh, so the average is ten. Bunch of people at twenty. Bunch of people at zero. So yeah, obviously there's something. Even if it's randomized, there's something else going on in all of their bodies. And the clue is why are they so different? If mm -hmm. assuming the protocols were followed correctly and everybody did what they were supposed to do, what that really tells you is, oh my God, there's way more variance in these people than our, our ridiculous like square randomization did. There's something, yes. there's all the people who lost nothing. Again, assuming they followed the trial correctly, whatever the protocol was, 
it had no effect on them. And then the other people got wild results and we're going to report it as an average. That's silly. Oh, yeah. If you're running a study right now on muscle gain and you were, uh, say, a, it's testing your supplement and you're in line to make millions and you want to randomize it, but you kind of want to make sure that your group turns out, put a couple of taller people in your supplement group and not the placebo because a taller person even though they're gaining the same percent lean mass, will gain more absolute numbers of lean mass. And like, mm. so even if you just forget the randomized by height, so you just do it by age or weight, and there's so many variables, right? So, um, you know, your, your control group is seven years older on average than your experimental group. All these things come into play. And so it, it makes it difficult. So which is right back to kind of a what works for you uh, approach. And everyone's, doing slightly different diets and you should try the ones that interest you. Um, but you really got to pay attention to then the, the full gamut of the results you're getting, not just weight. Yeah. And a, that a good point is, um, on this population based research or actually research from any, any type of, um, nutrition studies that, that come up with averages, um, unless you know your own data and where you fit on that spectrum, chasing around any diet advice is like, like you're flying blind because you don't, yep. you don't know if you would have been, maybe you were the average person. Maybe you're the only one. Yeah. But the yeah. data doesn't, again, you're still an outlier in that case. If the data was a bunch of people with a lot of results and a bunch of people with no results and you try the same thing and you get the middle result, you're not even representative of the research that produced that data in the first place because there was nobody in the middle. So how right. do you, you would never know unless you go through it yourself, you would never know where you fit on that spectrum. So you could be throwing darts constantly at the dartboard, trying any of these things, um, not realizing, oh, there was nobody at the average number. A bunch of people got a lot of results or none. So if you tried it, you're the way you, if you saw the data, let's say it was like you're saying bimodal, a lot of people, a lot of results, a lot of people, no results, but we reported as an average and you know, let's say 20 people lost, uh, let's say a bunch of people lost 20 pounds, a bunch of people lost zero. They reported as average of 10 pounds. You're like, well, I'm going to try that diet. And I think I might lose 10 pounds. You have no idea if you're going to be the zero or the 20. It's kind of a gamble. Yeah. And because you didn't, between. right. But you didn't really know it could be zero pounds, one pound, all the way to 20. If it's not like yeah. just because there's an average, everyone should roughly land on the average. There's, I think that's how people think about it though. Like they think, oh, I'll, I'll probably be average too. Like we're all kind of average. So why wouldn't I just, why wouldn't I just land on the average? But that's, yeah, that's not how, that's not how statistics work. I also make the argument that I, I think if you dive deep enough, there's going to be one component of your physiology or metabolism where you are actually an outlier and it might be something completely inconsequential or it might be something very consequential, but I, it'd be, you'd be an absolute outlier if we found an a person who's completely average in everything. <laughs> yeah. The, the most average person is the biggest outlier. Yeah. And to your point, um, yeah, it, what, where you are an outlier versus where you are kind of average, where you are an outlier is the thing that's going to dictate likely your, your results more than anything else. Exactly. Yeah. So I think you can give people a general set of guidelines. So in every everything we've published, um, we focus on calories and protein intake because from our experience working with people, you just track those two things, you can get incredibly lean. But and we start with a we start with a starting point. Yeah, sure. Um, a, 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 well, how else? Right? How else could you start? Start you with start, the, I, know. Oh, I guess you could start with the end point. Yeah. You, 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 oh, now I'm confused. Um, but let's say, so I say for John, for you, it's 2,700 calories per day. And that doesn't mean like it's exactly 2,700 calories per day. It means start there and kind of adjust with what works for you. But past that, it's hard. And you and I have been doing this for decades. This is a universal set of rules for dieting. And I was just in the middle of reading a book, a really well-written book. And it was, again, had nothing to do with diet. But just like so many books, they're like, let's just throw a chapter on diet in the middle of this book on how to live better. And it was so out of place. And in one of the universal laws was like, you know, it was avoid processed foods, eat real foods and avoid seed oils. And I was like, well, that's just a weird, I guess it's a great 2023 trend for sure. But 
Like well, and the people what, who what's run a, them. What's a seed oil? Seed oil. It's like I think canola oh, seed. oil is. A I thought seed. you said sea like the old man in the sea. All right, never mind. Seed. Seed. Yeah, yeah like algae. Yeah, I'm with you. Seed you. oils. Yeah, and you know, I, I I get it. It's it's you can tell their their guys who've had a number of guests on their podcast. Of those guests, five or six were current nutrition influencers. Seed oil is popular, so they just like blanket statement. That's a universal rule. And I was like, well, okay. I can't think of an actual set of universal rules for diet and nutrition. I mean, you have your kind of like drink more water type of thing, but one that really encompasses if you just follow this rule, you do all right. And you and I came up with one that I think works and it's the most practical approach to this whole thing other than, you know, take some guidelines and try to hit them and see how it works for you. But the how it works for you the best you and I have been able to come up with is don't eat foods that make you feel bad. And I know it should be badly for you grammar people, but we're going to use bad in a number of different ways here. So don't eat foods that make you feel bad. And the benefit of that as our universal rule is the ambiguity of feeling bad. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I'm vegan. And I'm vegan because the idea of eating animal products makes me feel bad. But you can't touch milk products, or maybe a little bit, but without actually feeling bad. So different use of the term bad, but still mm. a great heuristic for how should you eat. So um, when I eat a slightly higher protein diet, I feel good. When I eat mm -hmm. more fruit, mm -hmm. I feel good good um when i binge on like you know those big bags of candy that you get like at a movie right mm -hmm. i feel bad right so that you can take after that. you after you ate it or during oh the first cup you know what i was just thinking about this because i just ate i think it was like what's a, a vegan swedish berries one of those like accidentally vegan things heather yeah. and i read a play and it was like the only food there and i was expecting like to go out for dinner first, but I, I, I made us late. So I basically had to have Swedish berries and it was a big bag. And I will tell you the first three or four that they weren't that fresh. They were a little stale. were good. I think I was just trying to finish it. So I didn't waste it. And I would tell you the last half of that bag was already started feeling yeah. bad. And then that night just, felt really bad. And yeah. you just muscled it down anyways. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm not a quitter. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, right? Yeah. And I like the ambiguity of the word bad because you can physically, like I need for dairy products, if I, I have to use lactate stuff, if I'm going to have any, yeah. and I seem to be able to get away with it. So I, out through trial and error, I figured out it's probably the lactose, not any of the proteins in it. Right. So I can get away yeah. with it. But if I, if it's not available I, and I'm, oh, maybe I'll try it. It's not a good, it's not a good idea. And no, that's just no. physically turns turn like gi distress like physically yeah. feels bad then there is can it can make you feel bad emotionally like you can eat yeah. something then afterwards regret it and then think you're a lousy if you're person. trying to lose weight you eat a box of donuts you feel yeah. badly yeah yeah, yeah. not it, it might not feel physically bad in your system but you can feel emotionally bad about it yes you could be like oh yeah. man i failed i gave up on myself all i actually i would argue there's more of that than physically feeling bad I would yes. argue that the most pain people feel from their diet is their sense of themselves and how they how the worst bad you can feel is not physical bad. It's emotional bad and mental bad yeah. about I did that wrong. That was the wrong thing to eat. I'm being I've let myself down. I know there's a better way to eat, but I didn't do it anyways. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll try it the next time. Like all of this, like self doubt, self loathing, self regret. It if you've even bothered to think about nutrition and diet as something that has like a cause and effect. Like, like I know people who've never thought about this once. They're friends of ours who, like, oh, diet and food. That's just stuff Brad and John does like for work. But it's like they just eat what they want to eat. They don't care. It doesn't mean anything yep. to them. It's just oh, I like the way that food tastes and I eat it. And they're yep. not once ever thinking about if it has anything to do with the shape of their body, the look of their body, their health. They're just enjoying food. And I'm kind of jealous because yeah. somehow we ended up in an industry where we coach people on this. We write about it. We practice it ourselves. And it seems like too stressful, but 
that somewhere along the line, you have to be an adult and take responsibility with how you eat. And yep. the feeling bad, emotionally, mentally, physically, is at least some kind of clue that maybe I got to do something about that one. Yeah. And well, because we used to use the term, and I still use it in a lot of our writing, is just eating responsibly or eating like an adult. But I realized that still didn't tell you exactly what we meant. So this is it is, you know, it's a little bit of anecdote and it's a little bit of correlation versus causation. But if it's eating in a certain way makes you feel badly, stop doing it. Right. So yeah. if every time you eat really low protein because you're not paying attention, you get really tired and you just notice that as a trend stop doing that, right? Or if, if eating a certain way makes you feel badly about yourself emotionally, stop doing that. So, because we know, right? We How many people have we trained and, and gotten phenomenal shape, but they had different diet restraints. We had to alter the diet for them. And it was drastically different from that person who also got in great shape. So when it comes down to it, it's what is a sustainable way that you can eat in a way that gets you into the shape you want to be, it just comes down to, you know, a couple guidelines, calories and protein, and then eat the foods that don't make you feel badly done. We've, we've had hundreds of people we work with get in really good shape. And I would, I bet you there's not two people who followed the exact same routine. Yeah. As far, as far as how they ate, they all arrived there, how it worked for them. And we're talking about the frequency of how often they ate, what they ate, um, how they fit it in. This is a huge one, how they fit it into their life with their living Huge, situation, yeah. with their family, whoever, if they have, I mean, that's who you live with is going to have more impact on how you eat than anything else. Doesn't matter what yes. you read. Doesn't matter how much effort you actually have, um, how dedicated how you're you are, raised and who you live with, how you're raised and who you live with is going to, is going to hit this so much harder than, than how convinced you are by reading something we wrote or somebody else. Even if the science is like, sealed delivered there's no it's no questions it's it's exactly how it's going to work and and it's going to how it's work work in your body because you've actually tested your body and we know 100 percent scientifically this is the diet that's going to work exactly for you if your living situation makes it too difficult to follow it'll it'll almost be impossible so yeah well what's a regional Fruit, uh, Australia. If I told you that all the research per points to durian fruit being the most important thing for you, John Barbin, to eat in any given day, and you're like, where do I get that? And I'm like, well, Australia. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't well, live there. Bad. I don't live with anybody who goes there. Yeah, and I wasn't raised to eat that. I'm not not eating it, right? So yeah, yeah. so it's it's who you live with. Uh, it's just. Yeah, it's it's a lot. And then when you break it down, it's nothing at all. And that's the the really weird thing about nutrition, right? There's so yeah. much information, but it comes down to what are you going to do? How does it make you feel? And does it help you get into the shape that you want to be in? We found the video of my very first competition. And I was watching that being like, the way I ate back then is so drastically different from the way I eat now. And the shape is almost identical, yeah. right? So yeah. same person two different, drastically different diets and relatively same result. So you just have to kind of find of the myriad of ways it's going to work for you, which one makes you feel the best and then do do that one. And what makes you feel the best now might not be what makes you feel best in a decade. So you really do have to lighten up, follow your guidelines and then just don't eat anything that makes you feel badly. Yeah. And part of this, not part of this, not feel bad like the the goal is to not feel bad in all the ways bad can be defined yeah. it could also be adjusting your expectation like are you expecting to eat your way to like eight percent body fat like it's probably but still be happy with your life right like yeah. you're not no yeah. for most no. unless you're dieting from a natural 10 percent to eight yeah. it's likely you're going to feel bad it's it's going to be too hard like mentally exhausting um, it's just gonna be too much, like overwhelming, yep. which again would yep. just be another way of saying bad. So is maybe part of this reducing how bad you feel about whatever you're doing from a nutrition standpoint could be adjusting your expectation. Like, do you really want this to do something? You may just not want it to do anything and that's fine. Yeah. Or maybe yep. your goal is to get to the point where you're, you know, I just don't, I just want to eat and I'll just yeah. accept what comes on the other side of this. And then. If that diminishes how bad or good it makes you feel, that's fine. Like if you just feel, you know, you can be, um, 
yeah, really eliminating eliminating the expectation could eliminate the chance of feeling bad. Now, you, yeah. but that also includes accepting whatever the consequences are on the other side. Yes. Another part is yeah, I think you do have to experiment with diets because if you've only eaten one way for your whole life, you don't always know if you do feel bad or good. You have no comparative, right? Mm -hmm. So trying yeah. out new styles of eating. And then, you, you know, it does get complicated because then you have the, the recency feeling of like, it's new, so it's good for me. So I feel great, right? So you do have to give it some time. But in general, that should be your goal is finding a way to eat that doesn't make you feel bad, makes you feel the opposite, good. And then you stick with that and adjust it as you need. Now that can change over time too. Like stage, yeah. stage of life. There's, I don't think people in, well, you know what? I, I shouldn't make that assumption. You can well, you make quite... lactose, um, your example, right? You, most kids can digest milk fine. And then it gets worse as you get older. Wasn't that yeah, they're the, not, the yeah. case? Well, it's, it's regional too. different areas yeah, of the yeah. world have more or less ability. And then most, most people lose their ability to break down lactose over time. So that's one thing where you, yeah. you well, why can't I do this anymore? It's like, oh, for most people, that's just a thing. Viral infections can lead to food allergies. So something that you didn't yeah. used to be allergic to. Yeah. So you, you have to just accept that it's going to change over time as well. Yeah. And then your expectations, it's re that's a very direct example of your physiology change. So your expectations, mm -hmm. like, why can't I still want to have milk? It's like, well, you can't, like you don't break it down <laughs> anymore. So what yeah. do you, okay, but now it's going to hurt every time. Like as far as yeah. feeling bad, it's going to feel bad every time. So knock yourself out. I had a, I had a buddy in college. He was, he was scrambling up a couple of eggs and I was like, wait, aren't you, I'm pretty sure you told me you were allergic to eggs. He's like, yeah, but I just like the way they taste. I'm like, hey, but so yeah. what's going to happen? He's like, oh, in a half an hour, this is going to hurt. But he, <laughs> but he awesome. ate them anyways. Commitment. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I didn't really know what to say to that. I'm like, okay, he's. He's completely come to terms with the fact that he's going to, he's, he's going to have serious GI distress in about a half an hour. But for now, he's, he's waiting the enjoyment of the eggs more than the distress that's coming. I was later. just going to say that. So his good versus bad is like the good I'm going to feel eating these is, is actually more valuable to me than the, the bad getting rid of the bad I'm going to feel in about half hour. Right. So yeah. yeah and you, you have to make those ways sometimes. And yeah. that to me is an example of the physical feeling bad is kind of easier to handle than the emotional bad of feeling guilty about eating something you think you shouldn't have eaten. Because yeah, that's like that's a tough, that's you like beating up yourself and you're like, Oh my God. And like you feel lousy for the rest of the day. And you're like, can I really not do this? And is it, am I the only one that make eatings this hard for me? And like, why can't I get anywhere with like, again, all of this is assuming you're eating for the purpose of potentially changing your body likely losing fat that's mostly yeah. people don't normally intervene into how they're eating until they become aware that oh do i need to lose weight or somehow try to get healthier improve something to do with health you start treating as an intervention the minute you start treating your diet as an intervention it's almost like you can never go back right it's yeah it's kind of a it's a slippery slope once you go down that road and i would yeah. i would i would maintain it always starts with uh, composition to somehow look better and hopefully feel better about yourself by way of looking better, which again is just reducing, which was reducing the bad, right? So, yeah, we ended Eat Stop Eat with actually a, a Zen Cohen about that. How, like, you know, we food was food, then we learned about nutrition, and food became protein, carbs, and fats, and macronutrients. And then the more we learned, the more food just became food again, right? Because mm -hmm. as we talked about in the beginning of this, right, it's it's all sort of the same trends coming and going. And then the only thing you can really do is eat in a way that makes you feel good, or don't eat food to make you feel badly, mm -hmm. knowing that they're going to have effect on the way you look and the way you feel, and then balance that out. But that's all you could. Everything else is guidelines, and all you can do past that is just. Food is food. What do I enjoy eating and what doesn't make me feel badly and what allows me to look the way that makes me feel good about myself? And that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's obviously a lot, lot more to talk about, but we'll leave it there for today. Uh, the takeaway message and the best we can come up with so far is um, try not to eat in a way that makes you feel bad. And that yeah. includes physically bad, emotionally bad, mentally bad. And yeah. I don't know. I think if you just strive for that, 
you'll be headed in a better direction than going down all the possible rabbit holes. Absolutely. All right. Beautiful. All right. So um, thanks for watching and or listening to the Fi Life Podcast. <laughs>